Well, um, you know, in this New Year's, uh, we decided that it would be a great thing to have sermons about newness, you know, since it's the new year and new beginnings and all those kind of things. Um, I'm not going to ask how many of you started a diet or joined a health club or... I'm signing up for reading through the Bible, so that counts as a, a fresh start, doesn't it? Okay. Um, yeah, I got to that verse in the beginning. That's as far as I got, but I'm, I'm going further. <laughs> Just kidding, you on the video. Uh, so, um, anyway, so I'm going to be looking at um, a series of verses in uh, a part of the Bible that doesn't get noticed that much. But to me, it's really, really uh, essential uh, to understanding what God's up to in our lives and in our world. And before we're free to go forward into the new things, we also have to take a look at what we're freed from, right? What, what, every new start is letting go of some things in order to take hold of, of something new. And uh, this passage in, in Hebrews, uh, chapter 7 and 8 uh, really helps me get a vision of uh, what it is that we need to let go of in order for us to have a vibrant living faith. And uh, starting in uh, chapter 8, verse 1, I'm going to kind of skip around in here, but um, it says the, the point of what we're saying is this. They've been talking about uh, how in, the, in religion they have a priest who makes sacrifices for people's sin and that they have to actually, before they do that, they have to make sacrifices for their own sin because they're, they're weak and, and fallible. Uh, but then it talks about how Jesus is this new priest who's made a sacrifice once for all. So he said the point of what we're saying is we do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle, set up by the Lord, not by people. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices, and so it was necessary for this one to have something to offer. In verse 5, uh, the priests serve in a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what's in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one. And it is founded on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another, but God found fault with the people. And said, then he quotes from Jeremiah the prophet, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, says the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and I'll write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a person teach his neighbor or a person his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they'll all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I'll forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. And he says this, By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. So pray with me, please. Lord, show us what we can let go of. Show us what's no longer uh, useful in your purposes. Show us uh, what's obsolete in our spiritual lives. And then help us to grasp uh, the new thing that you want to do in us, and the new covenant, and the new relationship that you call us to. That's what we need today. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name. Well, I love it when you, when you come to a portion of scripture and it starts out by saying, the point is, because that tells you, okay, this is the point, right? This is the point. And they've been going on and on in chapter 7 about what a mess 
religion was and how it started out okay but we were unfaithful and then we got uh, obsessed with all these different things and we tried to make it work and we tried to earn our way uh, into God's favor and and we kept blowing it and the priests they talk about I don't know why they're talking about the priests being weak and uh, you know not very capable and why they needed to keep making sacrifice making sacrifice because they they were unfaithful and as the people were and it gets this whole thing he says that he talks about what would it be like if 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 God did something new and we didn't have to go through all these religious things and trying to get God's attention but that he would let us know that he really we uh, we have his attention already we have his love already what would that take and then he says the point of what we're saying is we have such a high priest we already do and it's Jesus who accomplished everything that was required for us uh, to um, enter into a relationship with God um, freely and confidently because we've received forgiveness that's lasting and says and he said you know he'll remember your sins no more he's not going to keep going back to him go oh yeah Westfall you really messed up that day you know <laughs> yeah I know that um, but um, he says we have this priest we've already got this God has set up something new and the problem is we're missing it because we keep looking back at the old ways basically he's saying Jesus is all we need it's all we need you don't have to cling to an obsolete religion you don't have to hold on to that which is no longer uh, valuable now um, in uh, in Jeremiah this passage that's quoted here it's really fabulous because it, it tells us what went wrong with the Old Covenant and uh, and what went wrong was God led them by hand, it says, you know, cared for them, led them uh, out of bondage, and, and said, but they were not faithful to the covenant. It, was, it wasn't that God gave up on the people, it was, that, it was that the people just kind of blew off the covenant, said that's not uh, what we're going to, to pursue. And, and there's a real interesting image in here where it talks about... Um, uh, Moses, even when he's building the tabernacle, um, follow this pattern because um, there's a, he said it's just a shadow, just a, a, an image of what the real thing is, but, but that, that'll help you in building this tabernacle. And I, and I thought, what is, that's kind of mis mysterious, isn't it? Uh, the old way was a, was a shadow, was an image of what the real thing is, what the new covenant is. Um, I couldn't get my, my mind around that uh, until I remembered that um, one of the things that uh, Eileen likes to do over the years is every time we move into a new house, she likes to have it basically torn down and rebuilt, um, uh, which is uh, its own issue, you know. But um, she goes, it's a new covenant, you know. And, uh, and, and I'm incapable of doing anything around the house. I have absolutely no project abilities. And so my dad filled that role because he was a contractor and a builder, but he was really a specialist in tearing the stuff down. He wasn't that much into the building it back up again. But uh, one day we were in our, our home in, uh, in Walnut Creek and Eileen she said, this house doesn't fit us. It's not right, da 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 da. And my dad and mom were visiting and uh, we were eating pizza and my dad said, well, you know, we could maybe make some." So he started drawing on a, the pizza box. Well, you know, we could cut a hole in the floor here and we could put in some stairs and then kind of build some walls and make a bedroom for Damien down in the basement. And then we could take out these walls in the bathroom upstairs and make that bigger and we could do it. And he's just kind of drawing this on the thing. And then he picked up a skill saw and started cutting the floor. <laughs> Right? And just like, you know, a big hole in the floor. And we're looking at this thing. Now what? Well, we better go to the lumber store and get some wood and build stairs. We were committed at this point. Now, you know, we got through it and, and he did put stairs in there and a bedroom for Damien and all this. He did all that stuff. And then the inspector came, the building inspector came to check the wiring and stuff. 
and in the middle of the inspection said, all right, could you show me the blueprints? I brought him the pizza box. That's all we had. And he looked, he went, you gotta be kidding me. No, this, this was it. This was it. Now, the pizza box was not the home, right? The pizza box was not even much of a drawing of the home. It was not even a blueprint, really, we found out from the inspector. Um, not at all what they wanted. And, uh, but it, it did have a, a shadow and an image of, of what was going to be there, right? And, uh, and Damien lived many years down in the bedroom and down below, and when we went up and down the stairs and through the hole that was cut right there in the living room, okay? Um, all of that happened, and, um, and the pizza box, it had some similarity to it, basically, but it wasn't the real thing. And I think what, what uh, the writer of Hebrews is telling us here is that the old religious ways, it's, it's got kind of a little bit of, of what God intends in it. It's not, it's not all bad, it, 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 but it's just a, a shadowy image of what the real thing is. Don't think that when, you, when you're following your religion really carefully, that that's really the relationship that I have for you. The real one is so much more real. Right. And the other's just a, a shadow and an image of it. And uh, because the reality is, and, and I know, you know the gift that I have is that I have no religious instincts. Uh, God saved me from that. And, uh, but the religion was always imperfect. And, and it talks about this, that um, it was powerless to do what it, to, what it called people to accomplish. So you could see with, with religion, with the old ways, that it kind of gave you a direction to go in, but it never gave you the power to get there. So, so basically it was a reminder that you don't measure up. It's a constant reminder that you're not as good as you think you are. You're not there yet. You're, uh, you know, you're always falling short. It's this constant reminder that we're falling short. And, and now with, with Jesus, with this new, this high priest in heaven and the new covenant, um, we have his power, we have his life within us to enable us to accomplish what God is calling us to. That is a whole different deal. God never asks us to do something that he doesn't give us the ability to accomplish. So now in our relationship with God through Christ, we can actually experience the fullness of the life that God has for us because he gives us the power to do what he calls us to do and to be. And, and that is a, a huge difference. And I love that this uh, scripture says, um, by calling the, this covenant new, it means that the first one is obsolete. And what's obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Now, obsolete. Did anybody hear that we have this new library in our country now with no books? Have you been following that on the news? Is that cool or what? A library with no books. Well, that's going to save money. And I'm thinking, boy, am I really out of it? Because I just, you know, kind of love the books, you know. I, I don't even read them. I just hold them, you know, flip the pages every once in a while, see if I wrote it, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but the thing is that um, it's telling me that I guess maybe the day of books may be moving towards being obsolete, right? Oh, no, no, no. See, you now you're going, okay. Yeah. For those of you on the video, the people here are going, no, 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 books. Books we'll keep. We'll keep books. Okay. <laughs> well, how about uh, in, the, in the technology world? I, I was a big music buff as a kid. I loved music, and uh, I, I used to hang out in, the, you don't know, these were the coffee houses where they had the people would come in and sing. And I loved the Kingston Trio. So I thought, um, uh, I thought this week, maybe I should go and get out some of that good music. So... My, the Kingston Trio number 16. What the heck? Yeah. 
Try putting this in the uh, CD player. <laughs> Jam that thing in the car. This is a reel-to-reel -reel tape. Used to be. Used to be, yeah. What a mess this is. They should make these better. I can't even open this box. Yeah, here we go. So anyway, it's like you, you, do you remember these? Nobody does. You kids, you kids remember these? You, you stick them in the big machine, the big heavy machine, and you string it through a whole bunch of stuff, and then it comes around here on this other reel and everything, and then you turn it on, and in uh, not even stereo or high fidelity, you hear, it takes a worried man to sing a worried song. That's basically what you get. Uh, so, can we agree that this is obsolete? It's basically unusable, although if you were to go out and get yourself a nice big tape player, you know, we could play this and not really enjoy it very much. And, and you know, <laughs> the day came where I thought I was doing pretty good, you know, I had some nice tapes like this and playing in my dad's old machine, I could sit there and listen to it and I was feeling really good. And then, um, I think I told you, Stu Blummer, uh, his, his uh, dad owned the uh, kosher deli that was really big in San Diego at the time. And uh, we were members of the Jewish Community Center, our family, so we'd always hang out at Blummer's. That was a big thing. And he lived down the street from us. Stu Blummer got a shiny new Chevy Malibu. Uh, this must have been, I don't know, 68 or something like that. You know, it's a classic, right? I'm not lying to you. Okay. I got a little bitter, a little bitterness going, you know, and jealousy, and um, but Stu Blummer would just shine the thing. And the thing I loved about it, it was fascinating, was he had the newest thing. He had inside it, built into the thing, and not just a radio, he had the eight track stereo. You, talk, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, you don't like it halfway through a song and it shifts to another channel. It's like, what the heck was that, you know? And, uh, and so, uh, and I remember one night, in my in my room saying Lord why are you blessing Stu Blummer <laughs> I'm a I'm not a bad person Lord you know in your wisdom in your in your way in your timing do you think Lord you could get me a cool car with an 8-track <laughs> in Jesus name I'm in you know and uh, you know what 35 years later he answered that prayer <laughs> You remember, I had, this, I had this monster station wagon. It was kind of like Chevy Chase's, you know, family truckster thing. Big old square thing with the fake wood panels on the side, like the country squire, you know. <laughs> and a uh, big old thing. And no kidding, God answered my prayer, the 8-track. The problem was this was about 97. <laughs> and people would give me these 8-tracks, you know. I, I had bunches of them, you know, uh, the Holly Ridge Strings, uh, I don't know, they were big, the Ray Conniff Singers, you know, people, you know, really dumb stuff. This one was the only one that I kept through the years. All-time polka hits by the Six Fat Dutchmen. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a Christian reform thing, you know, Six Fat Dutchmen. Anyway, so I've kept this. I can't play it. I have nowhere to play it. How sad is that? So now I've got the Kingston Trio on the tape. I've got the 8-track with the Fat Dutchman. I got, you know, I got all these treasures that I prayed about, and uh, they're obsolete, just like our religion. Exactly the same. And we may, we may go to it sentimentally and say, oh, I remember, you know, when I could put this in the country squire, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it's really no good. It's really worthless just like our religion. It, it's worthless now because God's doing a new thing. And when God does a new thing, the value shifts. And so what are we going to see? Um, I don't know if I write this. Can I do that? Or may I do that? I don't know if I can. Um, what are some of the values that shift? Okay, first of all, the new faith, the new... Uh, Connection with God through Jesus is it's going to be internalized. 
Got that? Oh yeah, you can read that, right? It's going to be internalized. He says, "I will, I will write this on your minds. I will, I will write them on your hearts." It, this is not a, a something outside of us. The the internalizing and psychologists uh, go into this a lot uh, for. Small children, they come up, part of what happens in their life is that they internalize certain uh, things and, they, and that's how they uh, grow into adulthood. Their understanding, their experience of things, their discovery that they're not the center of the world, uh, that, that mom is different than them, uh, all of those kinds of things. All of that is internalized and, and it helps shape them into the person they are. So when God says, I'm going to, I'm going to bring my, uh, my word and I'm going to write it on your minds and on your hearts, I'm, I'm going to implant it in you so that it becomes part of who you are. That's different than there's a religious thing out there and we're going to study it and we're going to, we're going to learn a little more. The second part of this is that it's... Um, by the way, I'm left-handed in a right-handed world. This makes no sense here. It's uh, relational. Got that? Y'all can see that perfectly? He says, I, I will be their God and they will be my people. We're going to belong together. We... we we, somehow in the religious thing, the relationship gets lost and, and the customs take over or the traditions or the way of thinking or the way of approaching or the, the behaviors that we do. All of those things go to the forefront and the, re, the relationship evaporates. And, and in the new covenant, God says, no, no, I will be their God I, and, and they will be my people. We'll belong together. And, and the relationship is central and everything else is secondary. And then, okay, let's see if you can really read that. Anybody can read that? Universe. 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 Good. Yeah, we got readers here. Okay, good. You know, those books will never go out of style. Yeah, forget that library. He says, they'll all know me. They'll all know me. Uh, we don't have to uh, go and tell us, oh, you know about the Lord, you know, because they'll all know. He says, from the greatest to the to the least, everybody will know. This is not open for just a small party group, you know, us four and no more. Uh, it, it's like, no, this is for everybody, and and that's a, a great change. But it's not all. It goes on. This is three words, sorry. In mercy. It says that we're going to experience this in forgiveness. Um, I will, I will um, forgive their wickedness. I'll remember their sins no more. That, that now, instead of being reminded of what we're not, or reminded of how we've failed, or we've let people down, or we've embarrassed ourselves, or we've fallen short, instead of being reminded of that, what are we reminded of? A merciful God loves us. Regardless, that is so different. So it's no longer coming into uh, worship with shame. Shame-based worship is, is obsolete, like the eight track. And every time you start to feel shame coming into worship, you need to think of the eight fat Dutchman. <laughs> Plant that in your mind. Yeah, that's right. Or John's pathetic reel to reel of the Kingston trio. Because it's all about mercy. It's all about forgiveness. It's all about come into God's presence with, with uh, confidence because of the reality of the forgiveness and the fresh starts. And then the last one, assurance, which really is just a fancy word for guarantee. I guarantee it. Remember that, you know, the men's warehouse? Um, I, I love this. If you look at, at this passage in, in chapter 8 and, and do this as a homework assignment if you want, you can go through and you can see all of the, God's promises, all of his assurances uh, going through this. Um, I will make a new covenant um, and I, I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they'll be my people 
and uh, I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. You know, on and on and on. I will, I will, I will. This is what God is saying to us. Forget the obsolete. Why pursue it? There's no point. There's no benefit. There's no life in it. And every time we turn away from the grace of God, and every time we turn away from His love and forgiveness and His acceptance, and His power that enables us to accomplish what He calls us to do, when we turn away from that, we're dealing with the obsolete. Forget it. Let it go. This is a new year. It's a new chance for us to, to begin anew. I, wanna, I want to covenant with you that this will be the year in which we accept Jesus' guarantee. What will he do? I think we should claim these promises. I think we should claim, we should say, Lord, you said you will. Okay, we're waiting. Just like I claimed, you know, the 8-track and got it 35 years later. But uh, I got it. So the thing is, we need to say, Lord, do in us what you've said you'd do. Do in us individually, do in us in our relationships, do in us in our community and in our ministries, do in us in our connections with the, the larger world, do in us in our relationship with you. Be who you say you are. And we claim that. And then everything's new. Everything's new. And when the shame starts choking you and rising up, reminding you of who you're not, let it go. Let it go. And let God bring in a new sense of freedom and forgiveness. Okay, that's it for today. Let me pray with you. Lord, um, we thank you for new beginnings. We thank you for fresh starts. We thank you for reminders that we don't have to trudge back through the old ways. We thank you that we don't have to relive our, our failures and we don't have to be reminded of our falling short. Lord, remind us of your love. Remind us of your mercy. Remind us that you're our God and we're your people. And remind us that there's a new covenant in your blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And we'll claim that in Jesus' name. Amen.